Hello everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Top 10 Trends. Swords have been used as a weapon for a very long time, and the concept is simple. Long, sharp metal makes a human bleed. But these swords, whether they're real or fake, cut through the fog of history and ascend into legend. These are 10 legendary mythical swords. Number 10, Excalibur. Excalibur, or also known as the Sword in the Stone, is an Arthurian legend and is a product of both myth and folklore. However, there is some evidence to indicate that the sword in the stone might be real. In a chapel in Monteseppi, Italy, there's an ancient sword embedded in stone that could be the key deciphering the legend. It's believed that Saint Gogano was a 12th century Tuscan knight whom Archangel Michael commanded to give up his sinful ways. Arguing that the task would be as difficult as cleaving stone, Gogano attempted to prove this point by breaking his sword on a nearby rock. Legend says his blade cut through the stone as if it were butter. Saint Gogano was canonized and word of his holy sword spread quickly. Obviously, this didn't actually happen. So whether the sword in the stone is a real sword or not, it was inspired from legend. There's also no perfect record in declaring that the sword in the stone in Italy actually belonged to Saint Galgano. So it might not even be the original sword in the stone. Number nine. Durandal. A mysterious sword has been embedded in the cliffs above the Notre Dame Chapel in Rocamador, France. Monks there say it is Durandal, sword of the paladin Roland. According to legend, Roland hurled the holy blade into the side of the cliff to keep it from being captured by his enemies. Since the 12th century, this chapel has been a destination for sacred pilgrimages. In 2011, the sword was placed in a museum in Paris for an exhibit. However, there's no good evidence to indicate the sword is actually Durandal. While the battle where Roland lost his life is a well-documented event, the first mention of Durandal was brought up hundreds of years later in a song about Roland. About the same time the Notre Dame monks began claiming the sword was Roland's. So, you know, it's likely that their sword was just linked to Roland, since Rokamador was the starting point for his journey anyway even though the final battle happened hundreds of miles away in a different valley. Unless Roland could throw a sword across the country, it's likely the sword in the cliff is not Durandal. Number 8. The Hanjo Masamune. These blades were owned by the legendary priest and swordsmith Masamune. Legend has it that Masamune and his rival, Muramasa, held a competition to decide the superior smith by placing their blades in a stream. While Muramasa's cut everything it touched, Masamune's refused to cut anything undeserving, even the air. I'd like to to know how that worked. While Masamune's works are valued as Japanese national treasures, one of the swords has never been found. Following Japan's surrender in World War II, the Hanjo Masamune was given to an American soldier, Sergeant Cody Bymore, who most likely took it home with him as a war souvenir. The GI has never been found, and the sword's whereabouts have likely been lost. Despite the sword's doubtless worth, sword collectors are no closer to finding the legendary lost Masamune than they were the day it disappeared. Number 7. Grom. One of many legendary swords in Norse mythology, Grom was the name of a sword wielded by Sigurd, the hero and central figure of the Volsunga saga. Originally possessed by his father, Sigmund, the sword was broken in two pieces during a battle. Sigmund gave the pieces to his wife, hoping they might serve his unborn son someday. Sigurd's foster father eventually reforged the swords into a weapon for him that was so strong it could cleave an anvil in two. As payment for fixing Grom, his foster father gave him the task of killing Fafnir, the foster father's dwarf brother who had transformed into a dragon after killing his father over some cursed gold. That's pretty dope. Norse mythology has most other mythologies beat at this point. After avenging his father's own death, Sigurd went to Fafnir's lair and killed the dragon utilizing some tips from Odin himself to win the fight. Then Sigurd cooked Fafnir's heart, because the stepfather wanted to eat it. Apparently, he also tasted the heart with his finger to make sure it was done, and after he tasted it, he gained the ability to speak to birds. So that's pretty cool. He overheard four birds talking nearby and learned of his stepfather's plan to kill him for the treasure. Then he beheaded his stepfather on the spot. Yay! Number six. Joyous. Joyous was King Charlemagne's legendary sword, and it was said to change colors 30 times every day, and it was so bright it outshone the sun. That's pretty cool. Since as early as the 12th century, two swords called Joyous have been part of the French coronation ceremony. But since both swords obviously can't be the sword Joyous, the mystery of which one is the true sword of the Holy Roman Emperor has been around for centuries. The Joyous residing in the Loire has suffered a ton of modification over its considerable lifetime. The oldest section is the pommel, 
which recent tests place sometime between the 10th and 11th centuries. Since Charlemagne died in 813, that puts it just outside of the Holy Roman Emperor's lifetime. The other contender is called the Saber of Charlemagne, housed in the Imperial Treasury in Vienna. The other sword is dated to the early 10th century, which is closer than the other sword, but still just after the time of Charlemagne's legendary sword. It might actually be Attila's sword, a different sword that has obviously quite a lot of worth to it. But historically, that doesn't really line up too much either. Number five, the cursed Muramasas. Remember that guy I talked about with the other Masamune sword? It was Muramasa? Well, he was that other swordsmith who was really good. And he prayed that his swords would be great destroyers because he was an because of the exceptional quality of his blades, the gods apparently granted this request and imbued them with a bloodthirsty spirit that if it was not sated in battle, would drive the wielder to murder or suicide. Cool! There are countless stories of the Muramasa's wielders going mad or being murdered. The swords are believed to be cursed and were banned by Imperial Edict. The edict was made specifically by Shogun Tokugawa Aisu, who condemned the swords after they killed almost all of his family. His grandfather had fallen to a Muramasa, and both Aisu and his father had been wounded by the blades. Finally, both his wife and adopted son were later executed by the cursed swords. Obviously, the swords can't really be cursed. What are the odds if the swords aren't cursed that Tokugawa would be so unfortunate to lose three family members and be wounded by the same sword? Well, that's not true. Muramasa was actually an entire school of swordsmiths, and the Muramasa blades were like the highest quality sword out there, so they were super coveted. It's no surprise that a shogun's family, who was doing battle against other wealthy shoguns, would be fighting against Muramasa blades. Most of Japan's warrior class wanted to use the Muramasa blades because they were so good. Number four, Hunting and Nagling. Hunting and Nagling are two swords used by Beowulf, and they came to the great hero in different ways. Hunting was lent to him by a Danish man. It was an ancient weapon said to never let down a warrior who wielded it. However, in Beowulf's fight against Grendel's mother, the sword was unable to harm the monster in any way. Nevertheless, Beowulf returned Hunting with nothing but good things to say, and it was useful in every single other battle. Nagling doesn't really get specified where it comes from. It derives its name from the word nail. It was often described as a fine and ancient sword itself. It was the weapon Beowulf chose to take to his final battle with Dagrefin. Eventually, much like Hrunting did earlier, the sword failed the hero in battle, breaking in two. Although this time it was because Beowulf's hand was too strong for the blade, which is pretty sweet. Number three, Crocia Mors. According to medieval legend, Crocia Mors was wielded by Julius Caesar himself, the Roman Emperor. The sword was believed to have shone brightly in the sun and was said to kill anyone it managed to damage. Its name means yellow death in Latin. It was a gift from the gods, or so it was told, and the smith Vulcan himself made it. Originally, it was the property of the Trojan prince Anus? I think that's how you say that. It's Anus. How unfortunate. Who received it from his mother, the goddess Venus. Aeonis? I'm gonna say, hope it's Aeonis. After it was said to have fallen from the sky and landed on the future site of Rome, with Aeonis hearing the words, with this, conquer, in his mind. Caesar had it with him during his conquest of Britain, and the British prince Nennius was said to have taken it in battle. For a brief period, Nennius could not be harmed but then he died from a wound sustained by the sword. When he succumbed to his injury, the sword was buried with him. Number two, the sword of Gujan. In 1965, this sword was found in a tomb in China. Despite being over 2000 years old and relatively untouched, it was in remarkable condition. With no rust, the blade was so untouched by time that it even still drew blood when an archeologist tested its edge on his finger. The craftsmanship of its etchings were also unbelievably detailed for a sword forged so long ago. And for the time being, it was a complete mystery. But after it was studied, the etchings concluded that the sword belonged to the Yu King, Gu Zhan, and it's believed to be the legendary blade mentioned in the lost history of Yu. According to that text, when King Gu Zhan had his sword collection appraised, there was only a single sword of merit. The sword was so magnificent, it was said to have been made with the combined efforts of heaven and earth. The sword stayed good for 2,000 years because the Yu swordsmiths had reached a such an advanced level of metallurgy that they were able to incorporate rust-proof alloys into their blades, much like we have stainless steel. Their swords were also treated with rust-resistant chemicals, helping them survive the ages relatively unblemished. Although I gotta say, this story's probably a little blemished, don't you think? In addition, the scabbard of this blade was nearly airtight, which prevented oxidation and allowed the legendary sword to be found in pristine condition. And number one, 
Tearfing. Tearfing is another magical Norse weapon, a sword forged by a pair of dwarves named Dvalin and Durin. The dwarves were captured by Odin's grandson after they left their home, and they would be turned to stone if they didn't return before the sunrise. The king forced them to make this weapon to let them go before they turned to stone, so they cursed it. Whenever it was removed from its sheath, it would kill someone. In addition, it would commit three foul deeds and be the cause of Odin's grandson's death. A berserker named Arngrim ended up fulfilling the last part of the prophecy by cutting off Odin's grandson's hand and killing him with Tearfing. Eventually, Arngrim's granddaughter, Herver, vowed to be a Viking and set out to retrieve the sword. It had been buried with her father, and his grave was on a haunted island. This is dope. Unable to find reliable companions, Herver ventured on her own, binding and summoning her father's spirit until it gave her the sword. The spirit tried to warn her of the curse, but she ignored it, and Tearfing would cause the death of everyone close to her. And there you go! I hope you guys enjoyed this list of 10 mythical swords. If you liked the video, give it a like down below, and if you want to see more content, please subscribe. What's your favorite mythical sword? I hope you guys are having a great day. Bye-bye.